I'm here today with Liz McKinley, Professor of Education here at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Thank you very much, Liz, for giving me the time for this interview. Can I start by asking you what makes Indigenous education an important area both in research and in policy? There are a couple of answers to this. One is that Indigenous people are very interested in Indigenous education. They see education as a, a vehicle or a means uh, by which we can address uh, some of the more um, fundamental issues around Indigenous peoples uh, generally, that is politically, culturally, linguistically, socially, etc. So I think it's important to uh, say that uh, uh, Indigenous peoples are very interested in Indigenous education in the way that we either educate our own or, uh, and also in the way that we educate the rest of the country and the rest of the population. So I think um, historically the education system that has been set up for everyone has not always suited Indigenous peoples, in fact has really suited uh, Indigenous peoples. I think there's a lot of information around, um, a lot of evidence to show that uh, in fact uh, most of the institutions have had uh, an aim of assimilation, yeah, to make you like us. And so um, Indigenous education is a way for Indigenous peoples, particularly researching it, to express their own wishes and desires about how they want to educate um, you know, our own young, our own peoples in that sense. So I think that's really important and we are uh, Indigenous um, researchers are grappling with the issue of how to transform uh, educational institutions and curriculum and things that happen in them uh, such that they better suit the needs of um, and aspirations actually of Indigenous peoples generally. But I think um, you know there are other, other things. Indigenous peoples have in colonised countries and Australia is one of them as is Canada, the US and uh, New Zealand in particular we talk about those four because of the issues that they have had First Nations peoples and they have um, had uh, settlers or invaders, however you want to put it, uh, come to the country that have uh, outnumbered them in the end. And so they have become quite marginalised. Indigenous peoples in these countries have become very marginalised. And I think, um, I think it's important, uh, you know, that uh, we note that they have been excluded, their knowledge, their ways of knowing, their ways of being have been excluded from the curriculum. Um, but I think probably for um, the rest of the country, I think there's an argument here about heritage. I think everyone who calls themselves an Australian uh, uh, needs to understand more about their heritage. It may not be their ancestry, but it is their heritage in terms of being part of Australia. Australia is nothing without its Indigenous peoples, really, um, in terms of being viewed from the outside world. I don't know how many Australians um, think about that in terms of how other people or other Indigenous peoples and other people see Australia in themselves. So I think there is an issue about learning about our heritage. Um, I think there's also um, education becomes a vehicle by which we can confront our histories. Yeah, everybody can get to confront their histories. Uh, I know they're not always pleasant, uh, um, and I know uh, there's lots of people out there that think that's got nothing to do with them. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we need to understand our own uh, positions and privileges that you know being part of a dominant society brings uh, brings to people, and how uh, everything is. Um, you know, in terms of the uh, country itself is centred around uh, a dominant society way of being and knowing. And uh, in Australia, there is a whole group of Indigenous people and something like 650,000 or more of um, Indigenous peoples who, who are marginalised through this process. Yeah. So Indigenous education is really, really important, I think. What are some of the insights from your own research work in the area of Indigenous education? So for, um, for the last uh, number of years, probably the last decade or so, I've been doing quite a lot of research in and around uh, schooling in particular, particularly secondary schooling. And I think, um, I think what we're learning 
in, in that context, in the work that I personally have been doing, is that there are far too many uh, Indigenous students that are uh, being, um, I'm trying to think of a better word than railroaded, but directed into pathways that lead to vocational education. And that to me is a very, very important issue um, in, in the research. Uh, what it means really is that Indigenous students have uh, less access and participate less in a rigorous curriculum that enables them to take up, um, well, follow their aspirations and also in terms of um, where they might want to go. So if we, if we divert students too early into choosing between vocational and more academic courses, um, then I think, um, you know, my research shows that there's far too many Indigenous students going down that vocational pathway. So, and what I mean by a rigorous curriculum is being having access to an English curriculum, for example, that makes them read, um, and I'm showing my age here a little bit, but things like Shakespeare or, or adult texts. So we have some research that uh, was done around uh, students' access to uh, curriculum uh, where they were being given uh, a young adult reading text as opposed to the more sophisticated, higher level adult reading at the age of you know things like 15 and 16, which, which shouldn't happen. So if you are reading very young adult work because you think that's where this child is at, then it's never going to be able, they're never going to be able to answer a question about the plot of Shakespeare's Othello or something like that. I mean, I just made that up. But um, you understand what I mean in the sense of being, uh, of having access. So unequal access to rigorous curriculum is part of that issue, really. There's uh, a lot of uh, lack of evidence-based uh, uh, Indigenous programs that are not evaluated. So we put in a lot of Indigenous support programs into schools uh, to support them. Ideally, and the idea being that um, if we make them feel good about themselves, it will help with their learning. But they're never evaluated to work out whether they actually do this, whether they actually achieve that aim. And then people get to dislike them because they become good, uh, good programs that Indigenous kids like going to. Right? It could be a sports program, it could be a cake baking program, it doesn't matter. It could be anything, but there are far too many of them, and schools deal with far too many of them, that are not evaluated and, and are not there based on the evidence of supporting uh, Indigenous students. We like to make them feel good, we don't like to make our students work hard. So one of the things that uh, people have been looking at, which I have found quite interesting, is um, speaking with um, successful Indigenous students um, and looking at what makes that success. Where do they draw their strengths and where do they draw, you know, do they draw on their culture and, and does, uh, do, are there, uh, can you identify um, a, a cultural, um, what's the word I'm looking for, can you identify cultural um, precedents, I guess, that students draw on? So who in their cultural background and their tribal background or their clan background represents success and what are those characteristics and, and can I draw on those uh, for my own success in, 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 a, in a slightly different context perhaps from your ancestors uh, and, and the way I view success and, and can actually achieve it. So looking at how um, parents, communities, Indigenous parents, communities can also have an effect on student success in schools. And what are some of the emerging areas in research and policy in relation to Indigenous education? Can I say that um, there, are, there are some emerging ones, but there are some that are just ongoing, that still need a lot of work to be done. And I'd like to just put in a plug for curriculum here. I think there's a lot of work around curriculum and teaching and learning in classrooms that needs to be done. Some very detailed work in some ways. Um, one of, I've got a PhD student who um, is still working in, in New Zealand because he's part-time. He's done a very interesting sort of work where uh, we acknowledge that there's lots of uh, non-Indigenous teachers in classrooms. Uh, we have a lot of Indigenous kids in, 
in schools and classes. Um, not in every school or in every area, but that happens here in Australia as well. But looking at that space in between, the pedagogical space um, between teachers and learners, particularly on topics that lend themselves to, um, to Indigenous knowledge and knowing. Yeah. So for just for example, uh, something like um, something like uh, controversial topics in biology at senior school, where you might have debates about things. So often those topics are about land use and about water use, about natural resource use. You know whether I should dig out the ground, and bringing into um, looking at where students draw on their reasoning for their arguments and their debates and some of these. Um, more controversial topics, for example, in environmental education. So to me, there's a lot of work to be done in that, that space in between, that pedagogical space, and about understanding where students are drawing uh, from and understanding a little bit about that. So he's doing things around Māori cultural knowledge and what they are drawing on uh, to, to, um, to decide whether they agree with for example, 1080 poisoning, or which is the type of poisoning we have for, sorry, Australians, uh, possums in New Zealand. Um, but, but you understand where I'm coming from about whether we should use it or not and, and what that does to all sorts of other creatures, not just the possums, of course, and the native um, species and stuff. So um, there's, there's a lot of debate here. You've got a drought um, and about uh, water usage for example. So water is a really precious commodity in Australia and, um, and in, in times of drought really more important. So you know what do uh, Indigenous people think about the flow of that water along there and whether it should be given to farmers in drought or not. Yeah there's lots of debates and controversies to be had. So that whole land and water and environmental use particularly around science and geography and things. So there's a lot of curriculum work I feel uh, to be done and, and the ways that we express curriculum even in terms of policy. So I think there's, that's an ongoing thing that I think we don't probably have enough people researching at the moment. There's a lot of space in curriculum uh, to identify uh, how curriculum uh, knowledge and knowing can, can contribute in lots of ways. Can I say another area that needs to continue and needs to get bigger is the school family community relationships. Incredibly important and not done well enough. We just, um, we tend to ignore families and communities a little bit in school, you know, we close the gates and this is our, our domain, king of our castle, you know, close the, close the door. Teachers are a bit like this and I, I can, you know, I can relate to it because we go into a classroom with 30 kids and I close the door and I'm in charge of those 30 kids for the next 50 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever. And, um, you know, I'm teaching them in terms of the knowledge and the activities and things that I have them engaged with. So opening up our classroom doors and our minds and our education curriculum and the things that happen in school to parents and community and their input, I mean real relationships, real partnerships. Um, you know, it's easy for us to think about um, that parents don't turn up because uh, they're not interested. Yeah, that's not true. I don't know any parent that's not interested in their kid or wants the best education for their kids. Right? So um, I think I think schools have a lot to do and I think there's a lot of work to be done there yet and a lot of research in terms of that. My next question is about the role that teachers can play in tackling some of the inequities that Indigenous students might face in schools and classrooms. If you could actually monitor students, track and monitor their, their progress in real time, I have to say in real time, not um, retrospectively, but in real time, if you can track and monitor their progress in real time uh, and you um, and you give them a lot of support and bring to them the reasons why it is that they need to do some of this work, along with the support for them to attain uh, the, the grades that are needed for the work and to support their aspirations, then, then they, they can and will do better. Um, but there's not a lot of that sort of um, underpinning support work because what that brings as well, if you, um, if a teacher can pick up uh, Indigenous students in schools, is is that it brings long-term relationships as well. So um, knowing families, bringing in families into decision making, and into the reasons why uh, this child should be doing particular things.
Um, there are other things, things like running extra classes and things like that, I think, um, I think are good. One of the other things we found as well, um, you know, many teachers say to, to me that, uh, well, these students just come in behind the eight ball, so to speak, you know, they don't have, well, you know, tell me something new. Tell me something that I don't know. You know, we know all the reasons for this. So what um, what I find is that when you do set up a, a data system in schools uh, to help uh, teachers, you know, try to gain the evidence and gain, you know, get the data, get them tracking and monitoring students, that they don't always know how to turn that into knowledge. So data, you know, score six out of 25, yes, that tells me. So what does that actually mean? What is the knowledge I gain from that? And then how do I actually then identify what intervention I need to put in place for students to lift uh, their achievement in that way? So teachers aren't always good at that sort, those sorts of steps. I don't probably think we, we teach um, people very well around uh, some of those sorts of things. And the other thing I think, uh, just to finish off, because there are plenty of other issues, uh, but the other thing that I've spent quite a bit of time in is uh, st students transitioning. Yeah, so some of the difficulties um, around uh, Indigenous students transitioning, and um, you know, between different um, different levels of education. Uh, so, you know, from the primary or from some of those lower, you know, that upper primary into secondary and, and from secondary into uh, into tertiary education or uh, of some sort. But there's there are various transition points as well that the, where the kids start to hit things like examinations uh, within schools as well. And I think that's really important that we pay a lot more attention to what are the things that build uh, good stepping stones and transitions. Uh, going from one place to another as opposed to, um, you know, falling between the cracks. Thank you very much, Liz. It has been a great pleasure talking to you today.